what do we do with the needy people of the world? How do we regard the individuals who stand by freeway off-ramps and on-ramps begging for money? Or those in public parks, haggard, smelly, spread out, obviously trying to catch some sleep in the middle of the day? In today's Gospel reading, we have what we call a literary hyperbole that caricatures two well-known members of first-century Palestine, the Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisees were a sect of Judaism that sought to keep faithfulness to the Torah by separating themselves from the secular society that increasingly encroached upon them. Only by carefully separating themselves from those who did not follow or honor Torah could the covenant community be preserved. Some of our present-day churches think and act like that. A sense of spiritual differentness and distinctness, which was morally superior to all its pagan surroundings, was applauded and honored. Members of this sect were considered holy men and religious authorities. Tax collectors, on the other hand, were detested as collaborators with the Roman occupation forces. They were notorious for overcharging people beyond the tax that Rome determined they owed Caesar. This was a practice that developed from the fact that tax collectors received no wages from the Romans to do that work. And so they actually earned their living by charging more than the Romans required and pocketing the profits. In effect, the tax collector was both a usurer and a user of his people. And yet, and yet, both are cast in a totally different light in the Gospel text today. The Pharisee, without any sense of his own sinfulness or unworthiness, is deemed unjustified while the tax collector went home justified. The text provides the reason. Thus, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled but all who humble themselves will be exalted. The, the, the message version of this text uh, puts it this way. If you walk around with your nose in the air, you're going to end up flat on your face. But if you're content to be simply yourself, you will become more than yourself. So it seems that both Pharisee and tax collector can be considered needy, needy people in their own right. You and I are in the same category. All humanity is needy in the eyes of God. But the good news is God has such a big heart for all of us. There is a dual quality to human existence. The remarkable Jewish theologian and mystic uh, Martin Buber observed that our spiritual natures have two pockets. When we reach into one pocket, we pull out smallness. We are nothing but dust and ashes. If we reach into our other spiritual pocket, however, we extract 
greatness. For our sake, the universe was created. The complex, twofold nature of humanity fills one pocket with a humbling stance before God that asks, Who are humans that you, O God, are mindful of us? While our other pocket strains to contain the equal truth that God created human beings little lower than the angels. If it is true that we are all saints, it is also true that we are all sinners who have fallen far short of the goals of God. The truth of the matter is, my friends, we are both Pharisee and tax collector, or as Martin Luther put it, both saint and sinner together. The persons in freeway off-ramps and on-ramps and those leaping in parks and others we categorize under needy share with us the need for God's grace. And because we do, we have, we have nothing to stand on to justify a condescending attitude towards any one of them. Not our titles, not our occupations, not our accomplishments. We have nothing to stand on to justify a condescending attitude towards these people. Meister Eckhart, a Dominican uh, theologian and mystic of the 13th century, once said, Do not think that saintliness comes from occupation. It depends rather on what one is. The kind of work we do does not make us holy, but we may make it holy. People ought not to consider so much what they are to do as what they are. Let them but be good, and their ways and deeds will shine brightly. Now, the way of putting it is good works inevitably proceed from a good spirit. And there will always be a great need for such good works in a needy world. Our risk-taking mission and service Sunday uh, experience uh, last week was meant to remind us of a number of things. We are nothing but dust and ashes. And for our sake, the universe was created. Who are humans that you, O oh God, are mindful of us? And God created human beings little lower than the angels. Good works inevitably proceed from a good spirit, and there will always be a great need for such good works in a needy world. I'd like to call on uh, Wanda Gay, uh, Olivia and Ruby, uh, come on up and join me up here. And uh, I've asked them all to share with us their reflections on last Sunday's experience and give witness to the two pockets of our spiritual nature. You already had a vision of the experience with the children and the wonderful giving hearts and clear understanding that they shared with us this morning. That was exciting. They went out into the community, but last Sunday about eight to 10 of us remained on campus and met in the lounge with Michael Aron. 
Michael is the founder and principal of Learning Works, a Pasadena charter school for middle school and high school dropouts. She passed out a list of about 30 of her students and graduates who are currently incarcerated in the juvenile and adult justice system. Most of her students at Learning Works are of color and live in poverty. She calls her students those in crisis. Our job, should we choose it in the lounge as we gathered together, was to select a couple of those students and pledge to write them occasionally to give them hope. These are Pasadena kids who have lost their way while growing up, have precious little support, and are now living in terror in jail or prison. Can you even imagine? Michael handed out cute Halloween cards and envelopes for our first communication. Letters will go to and from through Learning Works so that our personal addresses will remain unknown for safety's sake, our safety. Our risk-taking mission was to send a few drops of the love of Jesus Christ to thirsty, young, lost sheep from Pasadena. It is a calling and a privilege. Last Sunday started out like any normal Sunday. I wanted to sleep in, but my parents wanted to wake me up. When I got to church, I noticed things were different. No one was in the sanctuary. In fact, the sanctuary was dark. I'm not a big fan of change, and I like having a routine. I quickly realized that this day would be different. Before I knew it, I was faced with the decision which service, pro which service project I would be a part of. Relaxing in my normal pew was not an option. So I went with my mother and brother to help paint a part of a small home in East Pasadena. With the promise of a trip to in and out as a part of motivation afterwards, I grabbed a roller and some paint. Before I knew it, our group was transforming a dull-looking building into something fresh and clean. As I covered the old paint with a new, I thought about how all the people, I thought about all the people that would walk by and notice something was changed. Hopefully they would think the change was better, but more importantly, I thought about how, how I was changed. I thought about how important it was to remember that each time any of us goes into the community and does service in the, in the name of God, we set an example of goodness that will hopefully become contagious. Hi, I'm Olivia Dyson and I'm a ninth grader at Marshall Fundamental. During last week's risk-taking Sunday service, 35 youth and adults from FUMC drove to Muir Ranch at John Muir High School. We were met by Doss Jones' friend, Mud Barron, uh, Muir Ranch's executive director. First, Mud gave us an overview of what Muir High School does with its community garden, which is selling community-supported supported agriculture pr produce boxes and helping to supply fresh produce to schools in, pa in the Pasadena Unified School District. Then he gave, a, gave us a lesson on the birds and the bees, literally, and then we, we, we were off to work and divided into, into work teams. Tomatoes, sunflower, corn, and cucumber. Somehow I ended up on compost duty with, with my good friend Norman James. It was so great to see everyone working hard on their duties. The coolest part about helping out at Muir Ranch is that it doesn't have to be a one-time deal. If any of you love gardening and want to learn more about what Muir Ranch does. Muir Ranch welcomes us back to help out during the weekdays and Saturday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wanda Gay, um, Ruby, and, and Olivia. What would you discover, my brothers and sisters, 
If you were to dig into your own pockets this morning, will you find lint and gum wrappers in them? Or will you find life and glory? What do you have in those pockets? Some from the inside.